Welcome back to Ask the Compound. I'm your host, Ben Carlson. With me, as always, is the world's foremost expert in Oatly stock, Duncan Hill. On today's show, we're going to be answering questions about how safe is it to buy a Peloton since the company seems to be in trouble, how to hedge large gains in NVIDIA. This question was asked before they blew out earnings again last night. What happens in the stock market if inflation falls? How to create generational wealth and how to prepare yourself for a finance career coming out of college? We have one of my favorite questions we've ever been asked today, at least by one of our, it was one of my favorite people to ask. Uh, remember, if you have a question, ask, uh, email us, askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Today's show is sponsored by Fabric by Gerber Life. When I got life insurance, my first daughter was born, I figured I had to take that next step. That meant going down to an insurance broker in their office in some big glass building, sitting with them, having an awkward conversation, filling Sounds out fun. the paperwork. It's like half a day, right? It was kind of a, it's not fun. Uh, so Fabric by Gerber Life was designed by parents, for parents, to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy. I mean, it could be less than 10 minutes. You could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health, ex health exam required. That's some people, not everyone. Uh, join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash ATC. That's meetfabric.com slash ATC. Policies are issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. The usual caveats apply. I Next like we got show, our own landing page there. That's cool. That's, like it that. is very nice. Next week's show, we're going to be talking about insurance. A lot of people ask us term versus life or term versus whole life insurance, all this stuff. We're going to be talking about that, so covering all of that questions. Um, before we get into the show today, I want a quick shout out to one of our viewers, Mike from South Carolina. Mike is a firefighter. We actually answered a question about his firefighter pension uh, back on the show. He's going through a little bit of tough times. He's got a wife, two kids, uh, and just want to give him a shout out, tell him we're thinking of him. I think one of the things that we never take for granted here is how much personal information people are willing to share with us. It is kind of crazy. Like Some people just hate talking about money with their friends or family. People share with us so much personal information of the stuff they're going through, how much money they make, how much money they have saved, the stuff they're, the goals they're thinking about. Uh, so we don't take that responsibility lightly, and we appreciate it, and we appreciate people like Mike following the show. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So let's and do a question. And you're part of a compound family. You know, If you're here, you're family. It's That's true. Our, our solution. It does feel, the people in the live chat that come here every single week, half the time I think they're just here to interact with each other because they, they have, they've all become friends in the chat, but it's it's nice to know that the, the it's it's like a little safety blanket that these people come here every week to listen to us. Yeah, that's cool. All right, question one. Okay, up first today we have a question from Zane. Thanks for everything you and the Ruholz team are doing. I've been a listener for a few years now and have learned a lot. Also refreshing to hear from a, a fellow Michigander, which always sounds like a fancy kind of uh, goose or something to me, you know, Michigander. But uh, I've heard you mention before that you owned a Peloton. The wife and I have been considering a Peloton bike for some time now and seem to be close to a purchase. But given the recent earnings report and poor guidance, do you think it's still safe to purchase a Peloton? All right, I did purchase a Peloton during the pandemic. I used one of those 0% loans back in the day. It was like four years 0% loan. And I thought, why Why not? Why wouldn't I do this? So I think I just paid it off like a couple months ago. I was paying, I can't remember how much, 60 bucks a month or something. It wasn't even that much. I have to admit, I do share some of the concerns. Look at the stock price. John, give me a chart on here. This is Peloton stock. It's down 98% from the highs, just gotten slaughtered. I think at the peak, it was a $50 billion company, which is just insane, obviously. I always say that any any sort of diet or health fitness thing is, is really just a fad to me. And the people that thought Peloton was going to be like a trillion dollar company, that just never made much sense. I mean, and there was a time during the pandemic when people were, were on long wait lists to get them and stuff, right? It did have yeah, like it was, a boom. It, okay. But, and I think they just pulled forward. So John, show the next one. This is, I, I did a little deep dive on Peloton's financials. This is their net quarterly operating uh, net income. And you can see they, they were basically in the black for two or three quarters. Other than that, every single quarter, they've lost money. And they lost a lot of money in 2022. They've cut some costs, made it back a little bit, but th they're still losing money every quarter. John, do the next one for segment data. This is one of the reasons that I'm I'm still okay by the, them remaining a going concern. I'm not talking about the stock at all. I'm talking about the company. Uh, subscriptions make up almost 40% of their revenue. So they they sell their products, and that that's 60%. But subscriptions and recurring revenue is is 40% or so of their revenue. That's that's not bad. And if you John throw the next one up, this I just pulled this from their from their latest quarterly report. They have. 3 million paid subscribers, and it's basically been flat for a while now. They might bring a few in, and they lose a few, but it's more or less they have these 3 million 
customers that are paying subscribers and paying them anywhere from, I don't know, I think you can pay like $15 to $40 or $50 a month, depending on what kind of subscriptions you use. Because you can, you can actually use a subscription for their fitness classes without having one of their pieces of equipment because they do all this other stuff like uh, aerobics and weightlifting and all this stuff. So uh, it's still a $1.5 billion company. So it's not like it's going away anytime soon. So I think the biggest worry would be like, what if they just stop having new classes? They can't pay some of these teachers who have now become like mini celebrities in the Peloton world. Um, so the thing I like about this is they actually have this old library. So let's say, Duncan, I'm going on my jog and I step off the curb and I get hit by a bus tomorrow. That'd be kind of sad, but you, you still have 10 years, 10 plus years worth of Wealth of Common Sense uh, catalog to go back to. That's the same thing with Peloton. They're digital stuff. They have it on the machine already, so you can go back and use the old. So I, I go use the old class. They don't always use the new one. So I think you still have that old library to use. Um, so maybe they have to bring the cost in. You don't have as many teachers. They don't have as many new classes, all that stuff. Maybe we'll have some sort of AI-based teachers in the future where they don't need to have the actual people. They can just say, you know, this is the kind of teacher I want. I want them to show me how to do this. And you can create it for yourself on the spot. So I don't know. I know a lot of people think that, well, Amazon or Nike or Apple should just buy them. I think that's a terrible investment strategy. But maybe with 3 million recurring subscription uh, payers, that, that's, that's a pretty good, like, something to keep them going as a, as a floor for someone who could come along and have some sort of strategic partnership with them. A lot of people just say, well, Peloton's just a bike with an iPad on it. And I get that. But I, it, is, it is a really good product. And the people that use them like them, unfortunately, I don't think they're getting many new customers. I think whoever was going to buy one, for the most part, has already bought one. Why, uh, why wouldn't they just open up like the Apple App Store uh, and let other, other companies create classes and things and then just take a cut of their revenue? Wouldn't that be an easy way to help, uh, help people that have these fears? That makes sense. Yeah. Or, or yeah, give these new teachers some exposure and say you're doing this for free but you're going to get some exposure from us and you can sell your own fit yeah that makes sense but it, you wonder if if yeah they have to scale scale back substantially on the classes and stuff that that makes sense first but it's still a 1.5 billion dollar company so i don't think it's going out of business anytime soon but i am a little worried that <laughs> the experience is going to deteriorate so i don't know i still like it i i'd feel okay buying another one today if i had to that's where i stand but and, and if if Peloton goes out of business, it's a good coat hanger. Yeah, that's. Right? I was about to say you always have a really nice place to hang, hang coats and shirts and things. So. All right. Next question. All right. Up next, we have a question from Sarah. I have three percent portfolio positions in Nvidia and AMD. I've already trimmed them some, but don't really want to sell any more at this time. Even though I think the semiconductor space is overbought in the short term. I'm not comfortable with buying options, but I was looking at the SOX S ETF. Uh, is taking you heard a of this one before, Duncan? I I have. You know, I've heard of this. Oh, you? Have, uh, I didn't. I had to look it up. It's a three-time semiconductor bear. So yeah, you're inverse. Three yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, inverse. Three times inverse. So uh, they say is taking a small position, a small position in this inverse leveraged semi ETF crazy. It feels like an easy way to hedge against the red hot semiconductor space. But what are your thoughts? All right. Uh, Let's bring an expert on this. I originally started reading this guy's stuff. I think it was called the Apprentice Investor Series at thestreet.com. Uh, Mr. Barry Ritholtz. Barry, is that right? Was that, the, was yeah, that, what it was that was early 2000s. God, you were reading that in grade school. That has to be uh, <laughs> crazy Doing stuff. Book reports. But you, you no, wrote nobody about was this writing kind of about stuff. that then, right? But you wrote about this kind of stuff, and you wrote about the psychology behind it. Yeah, like, I'm sure we could give this person some tips about like different ways to hedge, but it, it, this is really a psychological question more than anything. Well, it's important. She sounds like an institutional investor whose clients want her hedged against potential short-term... Oh, wait, this is an individual investor? What does she care if semiconductors are overbought or oversold? Why is she talking about hedging? And by the way, the leveraged ETF, see the long and short, the, if you want to hedge, they're a terrible way to hedge because of the time decay of options, it's an expensive way to hedge. It's, it's, a, it's like a daily hedge. So you have to you yeah. have to not only get the direction right, you have to be right on the day that you're hedging it. Also, this, this expense ratio has to be 1% or something, right? It, it's crazy because of the cost. So the first question is just simply, why do you own these stocks? Is it for alpha? Is this part of your, you know, what uh, your cowboy account, your fun account? If that's the case, well then, 
let it run. On the other hand, if you have a concentrated stock picking portfolio and that's where all your money is in, uh, you know, it seems like that's a lot of work to be stressing about one thirty third of your portfolio. You're right. The whole the whole hedging thing sounds really good in theory. It's really hard to pull off in practice, especially if you're trying to hedge individual positions that have their own idiosyncratic risks. Obviously, Nvidia is probably a big part of that semiconductor ETF, and so is AMD. Actually, it's funny. I looked. AMD goes back to I don't know the 1980s or 90s, something. 80s, yeah. Listen to some of the drawdowns this stock has had since then. 93%, 90%, 72%, 89%, 95%, and 65%. And that's, that's that they've recovered from. Uh, NVIDIA's had 92%, 82%, 56%, 64%. It's funny. NVIDIA was down 64% in 2022. It was, I, I tweeted about this today. It was down to, to $280 billion in market cap at, in October 2022, and now it's close to $2 trillion. Wow. Which is, so I can see why people 10X. are thinking about this. And we, sure. we've gotten a million questions about NVIDIA. I hold this thing. Listen if it gets too high of your portfolio, you sell some, I think you probably want some rebalancing rules here. Like if it gets to 5% of my portfolio, I'm going to trim it back to two or three. I think that's kind of the way you can think about this. If you, if you want to not let it get too crazy where it's going to really hurt you if it falls to me, to me, if it's in my fun account, I just let it run. And if it goes to zero, so be it. But you said something a couple of shows ago that is, is very relevant here and has to do with the psychological impact you take out homeowners fire insurance not because you're hedging your house but in case of a catastrophic disaster you want to be protected and you don't want to worry about it at day in day out so if you're thinking about hedging a position that's done well it means you're stressing about it and and that's kind of revealing i think there's a bigger issue here than the semis and hedging it's why do you own this how does this fit into your portfolio and what are you doing that's making you so uncomfortable? Whatever this it is. This is like the George Soros back pain. Like she's yes, feeling the back yes, pain. Yes, that's exactly Maybe it's right. time to sell a little bit and, <laughs> and, and be okay with the, like, I don't know, hold on to some and it's house money, but sell a little bit and t if you're really that worried about it. And you're, to, to your other point, if you really believe in this stock for the long term, then you're going to have to hold through some volatile times because it is so crazy. That's right. In, in that Apprentice Investor Series, one of the rules for selling was figure out your sell discipline before you own something while you're still objective. Once you own something and it's run up, your objectivity, now, is she concerned about a drawdown or is she concerned about this going all the way back down and this big win, this perhaps change of standard of living win is gonna be disastrous, in which case then you have to think in terms of regret minimization, not portfolio optimization, but why do you own this? How does it fit into your investing? And how does it affect your ability to sleep at night? Yeah. And there's no right or wrong answer here because we don't know what's going to happen next. This stock could could keep going up and make people who are saying I should have sold look like idiots, but you have to think about what you're going to regret more if it falls 50% or the rest of the year, if it goes up another 100%. I, I won't bore you with war stories, but I, I could give you hundreds of examples of stocks that had run up 5,000 and 10,000. And people wrote them up and wrote them down. It was terrible. You have to know why you own it and how it fits into the overall uh, investment philosophy. I sold right. uh, GameStop around like eleven dollars after a double. After <laughs> hey, a, it was double a double back right before the right before the meme mania. No one ever went broke taking a profit. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I got to look at the newfangled iPod in the early two thousands and bought Apple and made fun of the guys at fifteen who sold it at twenty because I held it for a triple. Aren't <laughs> I a genius? Yeah. All right. Next question. All okay, right. Up next, we have a question from Mike. Is the supposed primary driver of the uh, monster move in stocks since November, if, sorry, if the supposed primary driver of the monster move in stocks since November has been the Fed pivoting, and if inflation stickiness puts off cuts or puts rate hikes back on the table, then why wouldn't the S&P fall back to October and November levels? Okay, so this, this might be true if the only thing the stock market cared about was the Fed and inflation. And I think some people get it twisted in their head that because the, it seems like the market and the news flow only pays attention to certain things at certain times, that there's a single variable that can control the stock market when there's so many other moving pieces. And sometimes the market really does care about whatever economic data piece you're looking at. 
and sometimes it just completely forgets it. So we could certainly fall back some if, if inflation is stays sticky and stays high and the Fed puts off culture has to hike again. I wouldn't throw that out of the realm of possibilities. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to retest that exact level. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. And, and I, I have to point out, if inflation stickiness, it, it's we're recording this in February 2024. Inflation peaked at 9% year over year in June 2022. We're, we're coming up on two years. I, I'm genuinely shocked when people talk about the stickiness of inflation. Not only year over year are we in the threes, but if you just look at the past six months, we're in the twos. Inflation is over. I, I, are we still fighting the last war again? I, I'm not focused on the Fed. I'm not focused on inflation. Assume rates are going to be somewhat lower in the next year, but we ain't going back to zero. But what's much more important to me at this stage than the Fed, corporate earnings, which look to be pretty good, the economy, job creation, consumer spending, all of which to be pretty good, uh, you know, long term low in unemployment, J consumer spending starting to slow, but that's just after the, you know, giant post pandemic surge. And then investor psychology, which is slowly improving after really getting battered by inflation. Yeah, to your but point, the Fed's one yeah. issue. It's, it's one of many. At the lows, the inflation in October 2022, in the market bottomed, inflation was still 8%. You're right. It, people say it's sticky, but it's basically at the long-term average. And I'm sorry, instead of 3%, it's 3.1% or something. People are worried <laughs> about like a decimal point. That's still way, way better than it was back then. And, and yeah, maybe the market kind of doesn't like it if the Fed doesn't cuts and puts off cuts for a few more months. And maybe there's some short-term volatility. But that, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that things are now as bad as they were back then because things seemed pretty bleak back then when the stock market bottomed. Humans have a terrible time conceptualizing transitory, conceptualizing the transitory didn't happen in a week. Everybody was upset. You, you look at a chart from the peak of inflation to now, it's like 18 months, 20 months, something like that. The whole spike in inflation, as Ed Yardini has written about, and crash, they tend to be symmetrical. So when it goes up really quickly, it tends to come down really quickly. And again, there's a whole collection of economists from the 60s and 70s, folks like Larry Summers, who think this is a 70s era inflation. It's not. If you want to draw historical uh, analogies, look at the post-World War II era, where you had uh, this spike in inflation, you had unemployment plummet as all these GIs came back to work. The economy did great, and that inflation also was transitory. To me, the COVID lockdown is more akin to a war than we had a decade of inflation and oil embargoes. And, yeah, and we did also, have wartime like spending, too. Yeah, it was very, that's right, massive fiscal stimulus. So uh, I'm much, and I lived, I remember as a kid going to get gasoline for the, for the lawn, my lawnmower uh, side hustle, and they would ask me, are, are you uh, an even license plate number or an odd license plate number? Because there was gasoline rationing. And I'm like, dude, I'm a 12-year-old kid. I don't have a car. You're like, this I just is need America. a gallon of gas. Give me my gas. Right. One of my favorite stories from my father is he said in the late 70s, to keep up wages, he got a raise twice in the same year. Like They gave him a raise, and six months later gave him another one. And wage growth is still pretty good right now. It's above the rate of inflation, but it's not like it's a crazy high number like it was in the 70s. Right. And it's making up for about three decades of very slow wage growth in the bottom half of, of the uh, earnings scale. In fact, one of the things people don't talk about, wages were deflationary up until the pandemic for like 30 years. Now they're playing catch up. We, we, should, we should really tie uh, minimum wage to CPI, so it goes up gradually instead of these big steps every you know, 10, 20 years. Yeah, and this is a huge step up for the bottom yeah. quartile of income. Yeah, I agree. And you've, you've written too, I think you wrote, probably wrote on the, invest, on the apprentice investor or on the big picture about single variable analysis. And you look yep. at it through the lens of, you know, don't look at just a PE ratio or whatever for the stock market, but the same thing is true with economic data. You can't just look at one piece of data and think that's going to be the tell. If PE was the sole tell of markets and investing, then A, it would be really easy to invest, and B, 
big, well-equipped firms would figure this out and arbitrage that advantage away. It's always much more complicated than that. I hate sim oversimplified solutions to complex questions. It's it just leads us to the to the wrong place. Yeah, and the market is a very complex system. For sure, the the three body problem. Not only are you predicting what's going to happen, then you have to predict people's first order reaction to that, then the second order reaction to the first thing that happens. Like you can throw a pebble in a pond and see those rings. But if you throw a handful of pebbles in, you have no idea where the rings are going to. Are we in a safe uh, space here? I, I tried to read the book and I couldn't do it. It's tough. It, it's a tough it was a slog. Hard read. I'm yeah. just, I'm just, I know it's, it's, everyone loves it and it's going to be, I think it's going to make it into a series on Netflix or Apple, but yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't make it through it. it. It's hard. You know, anytime something's written originally in another language like Chinese and then translated into English, um, doesn't make for the uh, most flowing of prose. All right. Don't tell anyone I said that. All right. Next question. <laughs> All right. Up next, we have a question from Bruce. I'm 73 and my wife is 58 and I have a 15 year old son. We own a small farm and house in Iowa. We also own three properties in Spain where we spend most of the year. Maybe we can get like a, an invite to Spain out of this. I don't know. Uh, we have no debt and are sitting on $2 million in cash. Most of it in short term bills. I deal in vintage guitars and will keep doing it as long as I can. We have a great life and are careful with our spending. I would like to have a plan to create generational wealth. Is this possible? Any suggestions? All right. Bruce might be the most interesting man in the world because I, yeah. he lives on a farm in Iowa. He sells vintage guitars and he owns three properties in Spain. We looked up, he in his email uh, signature line, he had a, uh, you would appreciate this, Barry. He had a link to his guitar website and we looked mm -hmm. at it. And he's got all these old guitars, and it's fantastic. They're so they they sell for a lot of money, but he's got guitars from like the 1800s, wow. like the you know like 1950, 1960. I saw one there from 1929, which I wouldn't buy just because it'd be a bear showman. But he's got some a really fantastic set of these guitars that he sells. Um, Why so would it anyway, be bearish? Markets are way up since 1929. That's fair. <laughs> that's true. Uh, so I think there's two ways to look at the question of generational wealth when you have a bunch. Of, so there's the Estate planning, tax planning, investment planning, wills, trusts, et cetera, that side of thing. That's money stuff. That's actually the easy part of the equation, I think. You can hire experts at a wealth management firm to help you with that stuff. You can hire lawyers and CPAs and all that stuff. I think the hard part is a psychological hurdle that comes with teaching the next generation about money. And I think the next generation can really screw it up if, if you're not careful. My favorite example of this, I wrote about this in one of my books, Cornelius Vanderbilt was the richest man alive when he died would still be one of the richest people alive. Like if you put it in today's dollars, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars, right? And he's, he even told his kids like any fool can make a fortune, but it takes like a real man, a wise man to actually keep it. And then there's this book that talks about how a hundred years after his death, all his descendants showed up to his, the university that bears his name in Tennessee and not a single one of them was a millionaire, even though wow. he passed on like the largest fortune ever at the time. Um, so I think you've talked about this before about like the first thing is do no harm. So it's like, I, I guess the first question is like, how do you not screw it up? That's the big question. Not like, how do we, how do we grow it? How do you not screw it up? So a, a couple of things leap out of this letter. The, the first is what, what does he mean by generational wealth? I, I assume he wants his wife who's 15 years, his junior to, to have a, a comfortable life. And then, his son, who's 40-something years younger than her, to have a comfortable life. So, so let's define that as, as the generational wealth. Uh, and then just ballparking what, he, what they're saying, the farm, the house, three houses, properties in Spain, um, uh, whatever guitars he has, I'm guessing he has three, four, five million to start to work with, maybe more, maybe less. The, the first question is why are you sending in two million of cash that kind of leaps out um, especially you know at the very least you should be getting four or five percent in in uh, bonds or that's the barbell your... portfolio you got cash right? on one side guitars on the other <laughs> right. and then the other thing is you know there's a tendency for 73 year olds to not think about stocks because hey what are they uh, my lifespan is I'm gonna live to 89. So uh, I only have another 10 years and uh, 10, 15 years, and I'm nervous about that. But you have to think in terms of a 58-year-old woman and a 15-year-old son. So that means this is now a, 
30, 40, 50 year. Right. The portfolio. generational wealth part of it is your son's time horizon is super duper long. Is equity. Right. Exactly. So he needs a portfolio that is constructed so that he could live comfortably on the income it throws off, that his wife could, could spend 20, 30 years. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of, of the wealthy families that, you know, put the kids' money in trust and don't let them touch it till they're 40 or 50. You know, I, I just think about how much easier life would have been, been if I could have bought that first house at 30. And now it's so difficult for young people to buy houses. Right, there help them should, when they need it. Right. right. There, there should be a way that, you know, it really depends on the specifics of the dollar amount, but plan on helping your kid buy that first house. I think people are terrified of having a bunch of spoiled brats, though. You know, but there's like a difference. There's a huge difference between having uh, an unlimited amount of cash. You know, I'm always aghast when I um, see <laughs> around the corner from me, my backyard neighbor, I'm walking the dogs. There's a lime green Lamborghini spider out there and i ping my neighbor i'm like i didn't know you were a lambo guy he's like it's my son's friend he's 16 i'm like get the hell out of here i would kill myself in that car at 16 you don't want to do that yeah you have to teach him the value you have to teach him to value the dollar and to work hard and all the that that's that's, earn it yeah but but that's true whether they have one year right out here on 40th street when i was coming to office today i saw a guy that couldn't have been older than like 22 driving a rolls royce uh suv <sighs> that's that's three four hundred thousand dollars. But I, I think the, right. the the not screwing it up part, especially like you mentioned, sitting in cash, like you have to figure out. You, you got to make sure you don't trust the wrong person or organization to help you manage it, because you're gonna need someone to manage. But like you can't take on insane amounts of leverage and spend too much. And it sounds like he's already got that figured out. He said they don't spend very much. He's obviously sitting in cash. Yeah. Um. So I think you just have to kind of give some of those same traits to your children, and and they'll be fine. But uh, yeah, I think teaching them to value a dollar is probably the, the true way that you help them compound, not just giving them the money and saying, here, have at right. it. For, for that planning, plan to make sure your wife has enough income to for the rest of her life. If you want to pull money aside to help your kid with the down payment, that's something you could do. Hey, you're going to have to pay for the house. We'll help you with the 10% down. So whether that's, you know, 100000 or whatever, I, I'm, I'm extrapolating out home prices 15 years from now. Yeah. Well, um, maybe that's part of it is just having the conversation yeah, early. Yeah, absolutely. Right? It, it's an uncomfortable, for a lot of people find it an uncomfortable conversation, but it's crucial so everybody is on the page, same page. Everybody's expectations are the same. You know, you don't want to find out the wife is like, I don't want income. I want to go travel for once you're gone, I'm hopping on a flight and I'm traveling around the world. You need to have those conversations so you can make the appropriate plans. Yep. At, at what yeah. point do you buy a university building? Like what level <laughs> of wealth is that? We have to do the Larry David thing where you have it uh, donated by anonymous, though. Oh, that's right, right. that's uh, I'm going to say that's a billion dollars. Oh, okay. Is wow. you, you're because okay. it's probably 50 to 100 million. Um and that has gone up because I think uh, the Booth School in Chicago was like a three hundred million dollar gift, and they named the whole school after him. So, yeah. you know, to, somewhere first, around there. Your first point, though, about like defining what is generational wealth. What does that even mean to you? I think some people just think like, yeah, it's gonna. You have to figure out what it, you mean by that first. It's not. It's not going to keep your great 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 grandkids, um, you know, uh, going to school for free. It's worry about your wife and kid and generations beyond that. You know, you, you, you need hundreds of millions of dollars to start thinking true, sustainable generational wealth. So Jared, maybe, in the, Jared in the chat says that 20 years ago as a bank teller, they had an old couple who would drive through one times a week in a Rolls Royce to get $500 in 20s to tip people with. That's what I like. <laughs> 20 years ago, spread the wealth. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I'll never forget. I can't mention the person's name. I'm at lunch. And uh, the check comes, and he slips a $100 bill. This is before his company got bought. He was doing well. Slips a $100 bill into the check that was like $100 in addition to his credit card. So the company paid for lunch, but the tip was on him. And then the coat check person, he gave the woman a $20 tip on an umbrella that could not have cost more than 10 bucks. <laughs> Spread like it around. Generosity. That, that's a good one to teach. All right, we got one more question. Okay. Last but not least, we have a question from Grant. 
I'm currently a junior in college working toward my finance degree with a concentration in investments. What are your thoughts on why larger companies like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley seek out internship applicants two years in advance when most people like myself explore various interests throughout college? This is a serious disadvantage to those discovering a late blooming passion. Uh, I love the idea of being in college and having a late blooming passion. <laughs> uh, considering the first half of college isn't major specific. What tools can be utilized to jumpstart a finance career straight out of college? I do think the sheer amount of information available these days, at least the people that I interact with coming out of college, they know way more than I ever knew about the stuff that they want to do. Like they know the kind of company they want to work for. They know the type of job they want to do. And they want to have that dream job like right away. And I came out of college completely clueless. And I think the thing you have to realize is you don't have to have it all figured out. Like Barry, what was your path? You were law school to trader to macro strategist to blogger and podcaster and then wealth management founder. Like you couldn't have plotted out that course if you tried. I have a totally ass backwards career path. Uh, uh, we call that atypical uh, career path. But I will tell you, my my favorite question that I ask at the end of every master's in business is, what sort of advice would you give to a recent college grad interested in your uh, going in your, your career? And it doesn't matter what the career is. The advice always seems to be the same. Build a stack of skills. Always be learning. Always generate a network, assemble a, a group of people that you trust and trust you so that you can grow together, be a great asset to whatever your boss needs in whatever field it is, whether it's finance uh, or not, and, and develop good habits, meaning, you know, we make our habits and then our habits make us. So make sure that, you know, uh, I, I develop the habit of reading and writing. Um, you should really develop a, a good diet and exercise habit. You should learn to be on time. Like you'd be shocked at, at the little things that can, you know, get a boss angry. Your Whatever your first job is or even your first internship doesn't matter to your career, but it's a place to meet people, to learn, to act as a stepping stone, to create a, a group of either mentors or someone who, who, who can be a reference, you also Don't have to think... learn how to be an adult in some ways and how to uh, act oh, for around sure. people. And I, so I did an internship when I was a senior in college. And for me, it was helpful because I learned what I didn't want to do. I think that's half the battle when you're young is even if you know, like, I, this is where I want to go. Working for one of these big companies, you can – there's so many different, like, places you can go, especially in the finance world. There's so many different career paths that you can take. So I think going – checking off the list of, okay, I know I don't want to do this one. I know I don't want to do this. Like, I, I had a friend who did an investment banking internship in college, and he said – he wanted to do it because he heard he make a ton of money, but he did it for a semester and he thought, I'm not going to work 90 hours a week. Are you kidding me? There's no, there's no way I could do this. So I think I you did, have to learn what you don't want to do first. I, I did that as a summer associate. You made a ton of money. You work crazy hours and you learn, oh, I don't want to do this. This is a terrible job. You're, you're making you know, a little more than win minimum wage, but you're working 100 hours a week. What, what, what fun is that? But, but the key takeaway that I just keep coming back to is – what you said is is you're learning how to be an adult navigating in, in the real world. And they don't teach you those, at least when I went to college or grad school, they never taught us those skills. Like right. the import, stop and think about it. I remember the guy who was the office next to mine in my first job was always late, really smart, really good, super talented, eventually got fired because he just couldn't get to the office on time. You have to figure out... You know, every dog likes to be pet differently is, is an old expression. Figure out what your boss wants. Figure out how to do the best possible job and, and you know, be of value to the company, even if it's not what you want to do for the rest of your life. Because every, especially in your 20s, every job is a stepping stone. You meet people, you, you learn skills, and then you move on to the next, the, you know, the next gig. Last week was career advice from Josh, this week from Barry. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, I hope, I hope we're not conflicting with each other. Nope. Two different <laughs> no, no, no. types of people. Um, thanks to Barry, as always, for hopping on. Check out Barry's new podcast, At The Money. Yep. Uh, Duncan was, and it's on the Masters of Business podcast feed, right? Right. It, it will eventually get its own feed, but since it's you know just a couple of months old, we wanted to... Uh, Duncan wanted to know who you had to pay off to get The Who as your song. Yeah. How'd you get that? The crazy thing, the, in the first couple of episodes, it was like the usual stress-filled news you know, um, sort of soundtrack. 
And I, I hate it. And I went to somebody and said, what can I do to change this music? They're like, well, how much do you need? I don't know, 10 seconds? Hey, as long as it's less than 30 seconds, here's the catalog. Get whatever you want. And last week was Fortunate Son. Like, I've been enthralled with the music I, I've had access to. Yeah, I was to. listening to your most recent one with Dunning, and I was like, right. how who are you? you get the who, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and they edited out the F-bomb in the middle, which was, I'm like, you know, sometimes this gets broadcast, so you gotta be careful. It's true. Okay, thanks again to everyone in the live chat. We love you showing up every week. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Email us, askthecompoundshow at gmail.com, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone.